Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of the Tilt Factor Research Laboratory at Dartmouth College, Mary Flanagan. Woo! Hey, everybody. Hi. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks so much for uh, all of your uh, attendance and uh, hopefully your interest during, uh, during this talk. I'm delighted also to be following an introspective discussion of Kant, and uh, I wish I had time for that in my talk. I kind of want to change all my slides, but not necessarily necessary right now. So today, what I'd like to do is spend some time talking about emerging trends in psychology and games, focusing specifically on social biases and how these affect games for impact. So I argue that using psychological metrics um, and methods uh, is, is really important for our community and we need to start utilizing these to really see when we make games for change, is there change? So that's my claim for Games for Change 2.0, this increasingly important roles that game are, games are playing in social issues, how can we really measure and think about what the change is? Okay, oh, this is a personal aside. I decided to say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'd like to show uh, uh, my, uh, I think this is the first evidence of my game playing. And um, this is, I was four or five years old. And I had operation, I have lost that version of operation. But weirdly, I made an adult artwork later in life that had operation. But I, I wanted to just share some personal things about why I do this work. I'm interested in the social change aspects for a variety of reasons, but I'm also interested in, in solving problems and asking questions in particularly unusual ways. Um, this is my uh, Halloween costume in seventh grade. And it was, a, it was a Goodyear blimp I created with my father, and it had functioning uh, lights, uh, a small communication system, and a, uh, uh, fans that would um, propel us through space uh, along with myself. So I just like, I, I like to ask questions that maybe haven't been asked before, maybe haven't come, I, I don't like to come at questions with obvious answers, and I, I guess none of us really do, but for me, the question of games for change, what, what change is really happening, seems like one of those things that's sitting us, uh, staring at us uh, right in our face. So I direct Tilt Factor, here's some images of what's going on in my lab, and we're at this particularly interesting um, area where we sit between academia and industry in this, in this kind of think tank, where we're investigating new kinds of ways of creating games that do things, right, do interesting things. And um, one, of the, uh, one of the things of note in my lab is that we have two full-time um, psychologists, social psychologists, who work conducting studies and gathering data on everything we do. So it's, it's, it's really, for me, thinking about evidence and how we can, we can plan for evidence evidence-based uh, games for change, not only in the design process, but then after the fact. So weaving in throughout the, the creative process some of these kind of psychological principles that can really help us become better designers and answer better questions. So here are some questions for us today in our short time. What can psychology teach us about creating games for change? And what are specific strategies? Because I know when we come to conferences, we get inspired, but I also know people like to take home some very specific kinds of, of nuggets. And you know, there are games that act as op-eds, right? There are games that act as creative expression. But when we claim that a game makes a certain change, if we're going to go down that route, I think we need to actually follow up with the data. And so, how do we do this? Well, here's how I've been thinking about the problem in the last three years. Here's, <laughs> we've got an iceberg. We have a lot of ice, iceberg-like things in terms of we have, we're faced with a lot of global challenges, we're faced with particular social issues, and we're also faced with questions of values and ethics, right? So this is this big mass of a lot of challenging issues. But the social, for me, and this is not to minimize any, anyone's lived experience with a particular kind of social issue, but this is a conceptual concern, the social issues that we see, that we want to make games for, often are the tip of the iceberg, right? They're often like, God, this, you know, we have to, you know, end this kind of problem in this kind of place. We want to make a game that could really address that. But what I'm starting to be interested more and more is this, what's underneath the water? How, is, how are our, our, our social biases that contribute to these social issues actually coming into play? We, uh, more and more I realize that we can't necessarily fix the social incidents without fixing the underlying cause. And so it's a really deep way, this mission that I have right now, of thinking about biases and stereotypes and things that are rooted inside culture and how they can come out and really uh, be manipulated and changed. Okay, so, so we know more and more about the human mind, you know. We know that there's, um, we know more about discrimination, we know about the dissolution of community, 
um, you know, income gaps, and many, many, many other social ills. And we know these problems are systematic, and that's one of the reasons games are really interesting uh, tools for us. But we, know, but we also know that psychologically speaking, we have some interesting psychological processes as, work as well. Um, and, and there's an interesting thing I want to talk about, a, a recent challenge issued by researchers to come up with ways to end racism. I don't know if anyone saw this, um, a, a national call uh, uh, by psychologists led by ha Harvard psychologist uh, uh, Mazarin Banaji, who, who was saying, okay, what, how, do we, how do we address racial bias? Can we change it? Let's just have some studies. Let's see what we can do. And here's what she had to say. Teaching people about the injustice of discrimination or asking them to be empathetic towards others was ineffective. And these are, these are um, leading psychologists in our country. What worked, at least temporarily, was providing volunteers with counter, volunteers with counter stereotypical messages. Huh. So we think we may do some, we see this kind of, we see some counter stereotypical messages probably on some of the games for change we see at the conference. But, but thinking about asking people to be empathetic and psychologists saying, you know, that's not necessarily working, we can't assume that by being empathetic, we're suddenly causing change. And so let's unpack that a little bit. And when I say uh, evidence, right, um, and, and, and I'm not picking on this particular game, but when we say evidence, I don't mean this kind of evidence. I don't mean asking our, our, our players to, to have a lot of data at hand and be able to regurgitate it and say, congratulations, this is a game about sexual assault. Um, I, I'm not asking us to say, you know, here's a quiz and now we have evidence of change. It cannot be mechanized in that way. I'm talking about evidence of, of, of psychological and behavioral change, right? So, so, so deep change. So what does that look like? So I'm going to play a game. Some of you have played this before, some of you have not. How many games have we played at this conference in the room? Come on. Okay. So we had to play Buffalo really quick. Uh, now, those of you who have played before, I want new answers from you. You have, to, you have to really get on this. So name a person, fictional or real, living or dead, who matches the criteria on the cards. Ready? I don't want to stand in anyone's way. All right. Shout it out. Batman. <laughs> it's not wrong. Okay, I, this is a tough crowd. My God, Marie Curie. Okay, what is this? This is like a crazy audience. Like, like, oh my God. Okay, I heard Einstein. I'm sticking with Einstein for this one, but only for this one. Okay. Yeah, go this way. Tupac. Visionary for many. <laughs> Multispecial. Oh, I like Obama. Oh, no. Okay, one more. <laughs> Lieutenant Ahura. We have a lot of good ones there. Richard Nixon is not a female scientist. <laughs> <laughs> so regardless, now this is the interesting thing about this game. Remember when Nick was just talking about um, uh, papers, please, and how we, we, we can't actually make points lead to your ethical decision because it actually won't be an ethical decision, right? It's a kind of a, a, a catch-22. I can't actually, it, it doesn't actually matter if you get the answer right or wrong that this game works. So, so you can answer Batman. You can go right ahead, hater. <laughs> You can answer Batman because the game is still working, and that's the interesting thing about this. So this game was called Buffalo, and it's it's created um, uh, in a in a, 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 a project for the National Science Foundation uh, to to try to tackle some biases and stereotypes about women in science in particular, but overall biases and stereotypes in culture. And what we're really working on here is trying to expand social categories. What we're doing is we're raising social identity complexity uh, among players, which is a psychological term meaning how much stereotype, how, how much of a stereotype you use for someone else. And we're actually embodying it into the game. So every time you get a new combination, it may be breaking a stereotype. Now, it doesn't have to do it all the time to work, and that's the interesting part of this game. And I'm not saying this as like, ha ha, I figured it all out. Like, I just whipped these games out left and right. You know, it's taken me 20 some years to get to the point <laughs> where I've been able to make a game that seems to work in really impressive ways 
to what we, what we think lowers discrimination. So this project here, we uh, have some, some notes. So we, uh, it's increasing the social identity complexity. It's exposing players to counter stereotypical examples. Uh, you, you'll get something that is a surprise. And then it's doing some experience taking and perspective taking as you imagine who that person might be. Now, I don't want to sit and talk all about data, but data is really a, a core theme of my project. So I, I do want to show you the way in which this works and then summarize it a little bit. So average social identity complexity and average universal orientation scale, uh, these conditions go up in randomized experiments. Now, when we're conducting our experiments, we have to have random assignment into groups. When we're, when we're working um, on, in the study site, we have to actually, like I administering a study don't even know the condition in which I'm, 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 I'm working. So, so there's really strict controls. Um, and I'm not sure all of, our, uh, all, all of our processes in the general game studies community uh, are as rigorous as they could be. And this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, going through the grueling process of trying to make data that can stand up to a medical trial, trying to have data that would actually convince doctors that something works. And this is the kind of um, uh, level that I'm, I'm holding this work to. These are measures of prejudice. So by increasing these particular kinds of measures and complexity and orientation, we're actually lowering discrimination. Um, that's the thought. Now, how long it works, these are questions of longitudinal study Many of us don't have longitudinal study, um, study plans. In fact, uh, we have been trying to do a longitudinal study across the country, um, and it's planned, it's uh, on the way, but it's not. This data is just from one sitting. But you have to look at most psychological studies and most psychological theories are from these kinds of conditions. Most of the things we know about psychology are not also done from psychological studies, so it's, uh, from longitudinal studies. So this is an interesting challenge for the whole field also, is to be able to gather data through time. That's a thing I want to push for. So in summary, this game that I've just showed you really quickly um, expands players' social categories and undermines stereotypes. And what's, what I think is, is, is interesting is the way players kind of take it on. So the game working consciously and unconsciously actually forms the whole of the effect. And um, I'll, I'll just show you some tweets uh, from recent, recent things. So um, this was funny. This, is, this was from a game designer, game design person. Game, design, game writer and nihilistic came up. Um, <laughs> uh, he, 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 was, he was liking that one. Here's, here are some that came up, uh, I think, at GDC or around GDC. Um, oh, yes, merciless game character. People reflecting, and then here's one, um, played a demo of Tilt Factor's Buffalo, most awesome game I've ever played about what a terrible person I am. Uh, <laughs> and while I felt bad, <laughs> I, you know, I, I corresponded with this, with, this, uh, with this Twitter poster, and um, he was really interesting. He said, you know, I couldn't remember the name uh, Sonia Sotomayor for Hispanic lawyer, and that's terrible on my part. So, it's, so this is a conscious reflection by players to say, gosh, you know, I, I wish I knew more. I wish I knew more examples. But the unconscious part of how this game is working really comes together for the change to happen. Second game I want to talk about, um, uh, Awkward Moment. Awkward Moment is a game that's very similar in, 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 in play style and mechanic uh, to uh, Apples to Apples with a few differences. One of the main differences is in content. And content-wise, we have, um, a blue card, which is a moment card, and a moment might be something like this. While shopping at the mall, you see a t-shirt, you see a store selling t-shirts for girls that says math is hard, right? That's a moment. It may be, oh, I got gum stuck in my hair, right? It can be silly moments, it can be strange moments. And then you get a set of reaction cards, right? So well, how do you respond to this situation? How do you respond to this moment? Okay, fine. So this is, the, this is what players are doing, and, and repeatedly, um, we've had tons and tons and tons of players. Um, it, 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 middle school ki kids just, just eat this game up. I, it, 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 they squeal. It's a very strange situation. Like, I, I don't know why that game is so effective, actually. Awkward moments really must be a, a fundamental part of the human condition. But uh, <laughs> at least for me, maybe. So anyway, so here's some, here's some data about, um, about how, what's going on with this game. Okay, so this game, we were really interested in seeing if we could, in the content, start to shift players' thinking about who is a scientist. Um, could we get more players to start thinking that women were scientists, for example? And could we, could we see, have players witness difficult situations of bias, um, whether it be um, a boy in my class is made fun of for wearing a pink t-shirt kind of bias, 
to another kind of bias that you saw with um, math is hard. A kind of uh, uh, people, uh, the, the moment would be a, 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 a situation where you're witnessing bias or you're even a victim of bias, right? So this, this, this little study on the top here shows that the, uh, the bias game, when we, when we kept bias cards in the mix of the deck, worked really well. When we removed the bias uh, cards out, um, the, the, that's the neutral game. People stopped, stopped associating women in science so much. So there is this very interesting thing that happened with our data regarding how we are actually getting players to start associating women with science. We also have some other kinds of studies where we looked at perspective taking and there's a, there's a common score where, a, a common like a measure, a psychological measure where you do some distractor tasks and then ask players to write an E on their, on their foreheads on a post-it note. It's a very strange, psychological studies are, some of the techniques are really interesting. So, so you're getting players to write an E and if they write it from their own point of view as though they're going to read it, they're being self-oriented, but when they write it facing out, they're being other-oriented. And basically, it's a way to, uh, to be able to understand perspective taking. You'll see this in the literature. And in one study with adults, playing awkward moment against apples to apples as a, as a, as a, as a comparison, 100% um, of the adults wrote the E facing the other person. So we were able to actually have, and, and you see that that wasn't, that wasn't necessarily the case in apples to apples. So it's not just the game mechanic. It's not just a social situation. There's something going on about how we're mixing the content and how we're really trying to get bias into everyday kind of conversation, everyday language. Same studies with youth. You see a little bit less uh, efficacy overall in some of the perspective taking and some of that is developmental about the way in which kids have, just have a harder time in general taking someone else's perspective. Okay, so, so some, there are some really interesting lessons from, from this um, game. Uh, first of all, g grounding the game in psychological ideas before the game design and then after. And then um, we were really, uh, really focused on trying to create uh, a play experience that was fun first. I mean, there's only so many kinds of, you know, if, if the game were about bias completely, in fact, we did this study, I don't have those slides up here, but we took out all the fun cards and just made it a bias game. Um, and we, uh, it did not work. Same, uh, same thing uh, happened across other kinds of games of this kind. If you remove, if you, if, if, basically it can be too much. People feel like they're being preached to. People feel like they know what the right answer is. And it's not a game anymore. There's no agency. So, so that's, that's the kind of core of how this game works. And I'm going to break down in a little bit the way in which those categories were um, dictated. So you can kind of see the ratio of different kinds of content um, in there. But just to summarize this, this study, this idea, um, it ended up, this, this game ended up uh, tripling players' associations of women in science. And that's done on a, on a, on a, on a level that um, is unconscious, really. It's just a part of, part of their play, part of players' play. Um, some might say, oh gosh, you know, you're, you're doing something to players unconsciously. Yes. <laughs> I would answer yes. And I would also answer, we have things unconscious around us all the time. We're, we're living in a world filled with messages. And so these games also have a, a message of responsibility. And um, I, don't, I don't really have a problem with that. But if you do, we can, t we can like debate afterwards if I go into it. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about game framing. There have been many, many, many psychological studies done about framing, about how you introduce a game or introduce a problem. I shouldn't say game. Very few game, game framing studies, but narrative framing, movie framing, framing different kinds of experiences, right? And how you set up an experience is called framing. So here we did, um, we, we introduced uh, the game in two ways. We said, here's a game and it's about awkward social situations. Same game. Here's a game about awkward social stereotypes. And just that framing changed interest, it changed the associations of women in science, and it changed people's re relationship to fun and attention. So that's really interesting, right? Like that, that, that you could have a, a, a drop. As soon as you say the, this game is, has something to do with stereotypes, there's a huge drop in what we're, what we're aiming for. 
so um, think about those, how we deal with these messages. How do we actually um, inform players of what the game is, is doing? There's another study I'm going to just mention briefly, which was a study one of my students did about Blockus, and everyone probably has heard of the game Blockus. It's like a, a board game um, version of Tetris type of thing. She did the exact same type of framing study where she introduced the game as a spatial game, she introduced the game as a strategic game to different groups, and then in the control she'd just say, hey, play this game. And you see in spatial rotation tests, you know those little shapes that you might have to, on a GRE test, you know those things. Um, we see drastic changes in performance between men and women. When the game is just introduced as a game, men and women score equally well on the test after playing the game. But performance is significantly changed by the, by the introduction, by the way the game is framed. This makes me think a lot about how we teach, how we package, how we advertise, how we get people to play games, how we do a lot of things. And um, it's shocking that we don't know more about very simple things like framing. Going back to awkward moments. Okay, so there's biased content in the game, right? So we have a, I, there's a t-shirt, math is hard, this, that's a biased issue. So that would be a situation involving bias. Possible bias might be a situation that's saying, oh gosh, you know, um, uh, Let's see, what's this one? Your older brother is being bullied and, he's, he, and you notice he's super embarrassed and refuses to talk about it. So there's something going on, but we don't know if it's related to bias or not. It could be just like a bullying. We don't, we don't know what kind of bias. So that might be a possible bias. And then there are neutral situations. I get gum stuck in my hair. I wave to my friend and it's not her. Or, <laughs> yeah. I play Buffalo and everyone answers with Batman. You know, whatever. <laughs> So all of those, all of those neutral situations, you know, are just kind of funny things that happen to you that are that are dorky or whatever, and they're um, they make up the majority of the content. So again, how does a game for change not look like a game for change? How does a game for change actually do its work, and it does better work the less it looks like a game for change? Yee, kind of surprising. Um, anyway, so you see the, the the kinds of ways that this content is is taken down player as a witness of bias. We're doing a, a, a game, of, a, a version of Awkward Moment called Awkward Moment at Work right now. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know, wow, some of this stuff. Anyway, <laughs> they're all true stories, by the way. When we write this content, we collect just people's real stories because it's unbelievable. Anyway, um, and uh, Awkward Moment at Work is challenging because in that game, we've put people in perpetrator roles. And in the middle school version, Awkward Moment at Work's really for middle schoolers, we, um, although adults play it too, um, we actually don't have a perpetrator condition. You don't do something to someone else, right? You see it or you're a victim. But the perpetrator condition is something we've introduced into Awkward Moment at Work, uh, uh, and that's, that's a, that's a kind of kooky thing. I wanna go quickly into two other, uh, one other example really, um, about the affordances of the medium needing to be really carefully looked at. Some of you may have heard of this game Pox, which is a, a board game about, um, immunization, and by playing the game it raises uh, systems thinking levels and, and other kinds of interesting stuff. We made a digital version of the game, it's for free at the iTunes store, and then we made a zombie version. The new one is much more dynamic, but this one was actually the study version. We tried to keep them almost looking the same, and they're almost the same size. So in the study we, co we conducted uh, across these platforms, uh, we, we measured all kinds of, uh, of things about systems thinking, about valuing vaccination, and which one would be more effective, or how they were different, and we found some really interesting stuff. Okay, so in, if you see the control right here, digital pox, analog pox, and zombie pox, this is how players were valuing vaccination. Um, are you, anyone surprised about the zombies? I don't know, I, I, I was. <laughs> wow, yeah, you know, I thought vaccination was, you know, I didn't think people would really care about being vaccinated against zombies, check again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then system thinking performance, really high when you have an introduction of, of, of a fictional world. Really kind of not so, this, these are exact same, game, exact same game mechanics, by the way. I mean, it's, it's exactly the same game, played in the exact same situation, two players randomized around the same table, um, and the digital version is far less effective. 
so sometimes people say, wow, you've gone old school with those board games, lady. And I said, well, actually, <laughs> I'm finding some really interesting stuff about the efficacy of, of those old board games. And maybe they might be more useful for us. Um, another interesting thing about this that I, I, I don't really have uh, with me is the, uh, the way in which uh, players of the digital game played the game to 10 to 20% faster. They spoke to each other 10 to 20% less. And uh, we recorded all the conversations, everything. And, and the game moves. And they lost five out of six times. And the players of the board game tend to win four to five out of six times. So we have a complete change in performance. I mean, everything. And, and, and it's, it's just an iPad. You would think, oh. Anyway, come to your own conclusions or read, read one of our studies on that on the Tilt Factor website. OK. So uh, these. These games have really, they really do show that we can change the way people think about vaccination, for example, kind of a controversial issue, which was surprising to me that a game could even have any, any, any effect whatsoever. Um, oh yeah, they die, oh, it was 40% more than the digital game. So, so players playing the physical game are actually talking to each other more and, and kind of working through some stuff. I don't have a whole lot of time left, so I want to get to the specifics, right? The specific strategies that can help you think about the way some of this stuff has worked for us. Um, tackling biases as a big part of the mission. Um, if, if we're having lots of stereotype th threat, for example, be evoked by the game, if framing is actually hurting people's performance, we have to really understand that bias is probably an issue every single one of us in the room has to deal with in the design of our games. And it's not really part of a design studio practice to talk about how to, how to reduce those. It's, it's, it's seen as kind of esoteric knowledge in a way. Um, that intermixing, the way in which we talked about that only, only about less than half of the content uh, was uh, the, the kind of core content that we wanted to communicate. Um, we've even gone between a one to three and one to five ratio and trying to systematically see what the limits are about efficacy. Um, employing a psychological approach to narrative. Really interesting studies about first person versus third person. Um, psychological distance, you know, if we hear about a story uh, around the world, we might be more empathetic to it than someone hearing about a story next door. Kind of disturbing stuff that we can find in psychology, but things that we can learn and use in the design process. Um, some people call this a stealth approach. I don't know, make your own decision. <laughs> But, but, but this way in which if you can frame something to hurt someone's performance, you can probably frame something to help someone's performance and help someone get, get to the place that you want them to go. Um, and I think that this relates to Zorn's uh, talk earlier about, um, about uh, growth mindset as, one, as being one aspect of this. Um, I'm also very, very about the team, getting diverse teams hiring people with high cognitive uh, and, and design dissidents so that we have a lot of disagreements, so that we're not all kind of having groupthink around the table. And that's one of the reasons we have psychologists working in the lab, not just for the psychological expertise, but because they, they, they do and think about very different things. And this moving fluidly between research, audience, and design, you know, this is the iterative process that, that many of us have talked about for a long time, is still something we have to get well, especially when we are trying to incorporate full research studies. They're huge and they're expensive, and, but we have to prioritize them because otherwise we, we really have to question if we can make these claims. And expect discovery and also failure. What if the perpetrator condition and awkward moment at work isn't effective? Then what? What's the contingency plan? How do I keep up um, expanding that game? Okay. Um, and then here are so, some psychological theories. Now, at tillfactor.org, I posted a, a, a reading list on the blog for today so that we, if you just were looking for, I want some papers, I want to read some psychological stuff, I just posted some at uh, tillfactor.org. Um, but thinking about some of the things that are actionable, you know, we need to design in and budget for experimental research. This is hard when, you know, the Navy just uh, announces a, to do a sexual assault prevention game for $80,000. Uh, you know, how, how do we, how, how are they judging the efficacy of that if uh, it's only $80,000 to produce it? Um, um, and understanding that, that, that what makes good evidence and what doesn't make good evidence. Um, there are a lot of claims that, that we really need to, to look at how the studies were conducted. And I learn more and more every day about this. And it's something that I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, um, very sensitive to. So my claim here is we need more systematic metrics. 
and methods to move the community forward. And I, really quickly, I don't have much time here, but I want to just say, why do we do this? You know, I want to put a call forth to the community that as this community, we need better tools and we need them because, because games are at least 8,000 years old and they have things to teach us, you know? We, we, we can't say we know everything about them. They, we want to research that, what we can do with them. But at the same time, they inform us and inform what we can do and how we can learn from the game itself. And so with that, I want to thank you. And I'm um, very happy to be here. And we'll be around after for questions. Thanks. <laughs>